Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. In this video, what we're going to do is learn all about React testing library. Now I'm super excited because this video on YouTube is going to be a section of a pretty large course that I have on Udemy that teaches you well all about React testing library. So if you want to learn some of the more complex features and really become a React testing library expert, go ahead and enroll in the Udemy course. I'll have a link with a discount in the description below. So go ahead and do that. So let's just quickly go over what we're going to be building and testing in this course. So over here, we're going to be building and testing this very, very simple form. Now this may seem very simple, but you're going to learn a lot of concepts when it comes to React testing library. So over here, very simply, all we need to do is input our email, our password and confirm our password and then submit. However, if we don't input anything, of course, we're going to get this error. Now, if you were to input some sort of invalid email, so for example, if I were to put this, well, we still get the error because the email has to be valid. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this and also test for these different scenarios in this course. And of course, now if you put in a valid email, so let's put in lathharb or harblate at gmail.com, but then I don't put in a valid password. Now we get the password errors. So now let's just go ahead and put in some random password. I'm honestly just going to copy the email and paste it in there. Now we get the confirm password. So if I input an incorrect password or a password that doesn't could uh, that isn't exactly the same as the password we put in here we get this error and now if i let's just go ahead and refresh once more if everything is okay if everything is okay let's just put in that you can see that nothing happens and we're going to test for this scenario now in the udemy course we're going to actually take this to the next level we're going to be building and testing this relatively complex application and here this is where we're going to take our react testing libraries to the next level so this is a adoption uh, adoption website where we adopt cats so over here we have the name of the cat and over here we have the contact information for the people uh, that we can contact to adopt this cat and what's really nice about this, let me zoom once more, is we can favorite the cats that we like. And we're, of course, we're going to test for this. And then we can also filter for, well, favorite or not favorite. And of course, this is also something we're going to learn how to test for in React Testing Library. We can also filter by gender. So we can have multiple filters. We can say male and favorite. In this case, we have nothing. Male and not favored. Well, in this case, we have these cats. So over here, you can see you can do these really complex filters. And what's really nice about this is if you if I refresh, look at the cards and how they render, they don't render right away. So this is actually coming to us from a server. So we're going to learn how to mock HTTP requests uh, in our application, which is something that happens all the time inside of React apps. So again, if you want to take your um, your uh, skills to the next level, go ahead and enroll in the course. I'm also going to add a future section, which I don't have right now, about how to test React Router. So that is going to be the course. I hope you guys enjoy it and I'll see you in the next one. Before we start diving deep into React testing library, we first need to understand what is testing and why do we care about it? So that is what we are going to uncover in this lecture starting with what is testing? Well, simply put, testing is a method to check whether the actual product matches the expected requirements. So we might have a product and we want this product to do something that is our expected requirements. So in order to see that it actually meets that expectation, we need to test it. Let's actually look at an example to illustrate what I'm saying here. Let's say we have a product and this product is a video game. And inside of this video game, we have a character and this character has a health bar. Now, whenever this character gets hit, what we expect this video game to do is decrease the health bar. So we have a product, which is a video game. And once the character gets hit, we expect that the health bar decreases. Now we need to make sure that this actually occurs. And of course, we're going to make sure that this occurs with testing. 
And we'll talk about the different ways we can test the different types of testing in future lectures. But for now, that is pretty much what testing is. Now, testing isn't isolated to software applications. So for example, a software application like Google, of course, they test their app, they continuously test it. You know, anytime you want to search something, they want to test that you get the expected results. But there are other companies that are not software related like Casper that sells mattresses. They rigorously test their mattresses. They, they test the texture, they test the firmness, they test that you know it meets the user's expectation. It meets what they expect of their product. And this is just a mattress. And there are other car companies like Porsche that also rigorously test their cars to make sure that they work the way that they intend them to work. So for example, if you ever seen those safety tests where a car rams into a wall with a dummy inside it, those are tests to test that, hey, the car is meeting some sort of safety expectations, some sort of safety requirements. So they smash $100,000 cars in order to test this out. So again, it's not just isolated to software companies. Now, now that we know exactly what a testing is, let's actually talk about why we want to test. And after going through this, I do expect you to have an idea of exactly why we want to test. But the main reason we want to test our product is we want to increase our confidence in our product. We want to make sure that our product delivers what we expect it to deliver. And what that means that we have high reliability. So no matter how many times we reproduce the same thing, it results in the same action, it results in the same uh, requirement. We want to increase the reliability and we want to decrease the defects. So any defects that occurs. And in software development, this could be a bug. So that is exactly why we want to test. And I hope that makes it clear in this lecture. We learned about what testing is, and we also learned why testing is important, but we didn't really learn how we can test our products, how we can test our applications. So that's what we're gonna be doing in this section. In this section, we're going to uncover the different types of testing methodologies. Now, when it comes to testing, there's only two main methodologies that you can utilize, and that is either manual testing or automated testing. So let's actually look at what manual testing is first, and then we'll look at what automated testing is. So in order to understand this, let's actually look at a real life example. So let's say that we have this form right over here and you're asked to validate that the email that they input is actually a correct email. So right here, of course, they can type in whatever email they want. And then when they click submit, if this is not a valid email, we want to show an error, some sort of error message saying that this is not a valid email. Please try again. So what you would do, what any developer would do is they would go to the code and then inside of the code, they would do some things, you know, they would try to add that uh, logic. I already did this. So they'll try to add this logic. And then what they would want to do is test it out. So at the very end, you want to test out if their feature, their new feature that they want to add actually works. Now, how would they do that? Well, they would open up this application in their local machine and they would type in an invalid email inside of this email right over here. So you, they would say something like lathe and then maybe they would forget the at sign and they would just say lathehotmail.com. And then the, what they would do is click this button right over here and look at that. We see the error message. The email, the email you input is invalid. So what did we just do here? Well, we just tested our application to make sure that it works the way that we expected, but we did it manually. We manually opened up an instance of our application. We manually typed in an invalid email. We manually clicked this button. And lastly, we manually validated that we got our error. And this is manual testing and developers do manual testing all the time. It's almost done simultaneously with actual development. So that right there is manual testing when you actually physically do the thing. So now let's talk about automated testing. 
Well, automated testing is where you write a test in code describing the behavior that you want and the outcome that you expect. So the behavior that I want is I want to go ahead and type in an invalid email. And then the outcome that I expect is that I get this error. So what I can, what I can do is I can write a test for this, an automated test in code. And an example of this example of what exactly we just did with manual testing is this test right over here. So I have this test that should uh, show email error if email is invalid. And right here, you can see that we're typing in an invalid email. As you can see, this is an invalid email. There's no at sign. And what we're doing is we're expecting this error message to be in the document. So this right here is an automated test that did exactly what we did when manually testing it. So that is a difference between automated tests as well as manual tests. Now, why would we ever want to do manual tests? Writing all this seems a lot more work than just simply doing this and then clicking the button and then validating that it's there. Well, the reason why you want to do automated tests is as your application gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes very, very impractical to manually test every single feature. Whereas with automated tests, you can see here, we have a test for every single feature. And all we simply have to do is run our test suite and check if everything passes. If everything passes, we have increased confidence in our application. We know our application is reliable and there's going to be definitely less and less bugs. So just to point out a, a, an example of where manual tests can really fail us, let's actually look at a scenario where, you know, I do some changes. Maybe I want to change this from email address to email. I don't know, just email itself without email addresses. So I go over here and uh, I go and I say, uh, where's the email? So I change this to email right over here. So I change that to email. Everything seems all fine and dandy. And then once I scroll up, I see over here, oh my goodness, he has a bunch of if else statements. I actually prefer to have if statements instead of if else statements. I don't know why would someone would do this, but they, they did it. They went ahead and did it and saved their app. Well, now if they were to refresh, they can check over here. Okay, everything is working fine. Let me just quickly input an invalid email. You know, everything seems okay. Or let's actually put in a valid email, maybe a password here, but an invalid confirmed password. And I can see here, okay, the tests work exactly the way that we intend. Okay, that is completely fine. I'm going to go ahead and ship this inside of production. Well, actually, what you did right here is actually going to cause some problems. So if we opened up our terminal, you can see that our tests actually caught a potential issue that we actually didn't catch when manually testing our application. So what we can actually do is now look at the tests themselves and we can go here, we can scroll up and look at some of the failing tests. So it seems that this test right here is failing should show email error if email is invalid. Hmm, why is that the case? So now what I can actually do is input an invalid email, submit this, and I can see I get a different error. You know, the password you entered should not contain five characters or more. So you can see that if I did manual testing, I wouldn't have caught this error, but with automated testing, I did. And then I can, of course, debug exactly why I did that. And then I can realize, oh, okay, so it's the else if are the things that guard for this. So automated testing allow us to catch things that we would most definitely miss with manual testing if our application gets big enough. Now you can see here that we also have another automated uh, failed test. I'm not really sure what that is. Let's go over here and say address, address. So let's save that. Let's save that. Let's just get rid of this test over here and let's run it again. Let's see why that is. And then we want to see all of the tests. All right, everything is all fine. Now our application is fine and uh, we are confident in it. So I hope that makes it clear exactly why we also want to automate our test. Now React Testing Library is a library that allows us to write these tests for our React application and therefore increasing the confidence of our React app.
In this section of the course, what we're gonna do is learn about TDD. Now this stands for Test Driven Development. And what it means is a process where we write our tests before we write the feature. So let's actually look at an example for this. So let's say in our application, we have a button. And what we want to do is when a user clicks on this button, we want to change the color of this button to purple. Very, very simple feature. And of course, we have to go into our code and code it out. Now, if we were following test-driven development, we wouldn't go right ahead and code out the feature itself. What we would do instead is write a test testing that feature. So right over here, this square box symbolizes the test that we are initially going to write. We're not gonna write the feature, we're gonna write the test first. Now because the feature doesn't exist, well that test is going to fail. And as you can see here, we have a red failing test. And then the next process is to go ahead and code out that feature. And once we code out that feature and it's behaving the way that we want it to, well, that test should pass. That same test that we wrote over here should be green, meaning it has passed. And that is test-driven development. We write the test first, and then we write the feature, and then the test should pass. Now, this is also known as red-green testing because initially your tests are gonna be red, meaning that they are failing. And then you write your feature, then they turn green, meaning that they are passing. Now, why in the world would we ever care about test-driven development? Well, there's actually a few reasons. Testing becomes a part of development. A lot of the time, testing feels like a chore, especially if you leave it at the very end. You write your feature, then you're like, oh my goodness, now I have to go ahead and write a bunch of tests for this. When you're doing test-driven development, you're very cognizant of the test, and testing actually becomes a part of the development process, which is really, really important. Another one is that you write cleaner code. It's actually a known fact that when you apply test-driven development, developers tend to write the smallest unit to make that test pass. Whereas if they don't have a test, they tend to have more code, more complexity, more complexity, and it just becomes a little bit unnecessary. And lastly, it reduces bugs. When you follow test-driven development, you actually end up writing more tests. And of course, the more tests you have, the less likely that you're going to have defects and bugs in your application. And that right there is why a lot of people encourage test-driven development. Welcome to the section of the course where we're going to get our hands dirty and start utilizing React Testing Library. Now, in order to utilize React Testing Library, we need to have an application to test. And what we're going to do is follow the test-driven development methodology. So what we're going to do is write our test and then write our feature and then make sure that the tests pass. So at the end of the day, what we're going to do in this section is test our application and also write our application. So we're not just going to have a fully pledged application and we're just going to test it. No, we're going to write it and test it simultaneously. Now, what's the application that we're going to be building? Well, we're going to be building a very simple form application. And you guys seen this before. So over here, we have this very simple sign up form where a user puts their email, puts their password and confirms their password. And this right here is the design and this is how it should look. Now, the other images are going to show how it should behave. So if you were to put an invalid email, what we should have is this error over here that says the email you input is invalid. And we get this error once we click submit on an invalid email. Now, if we have a valid email, but an invalid password, we get this error. And then if we just do not confirm our password correctly, then we get this error right over here. So this is what we are going to build and test with React Testing Library. So you know what, let's just get right into it. In this video, what we're gonna do is create a React application and we're also going to inspect the boilerplate code. So let's just get right into it. So the first thing that we need to do to create a React application is we need to go and open up our terminal or our command prompt if we're on Windows and move into whatever directory we want our application to live in. And then once we're there, 
what we would execute is npx create react app and then we're going to give our react application a name let's call it sign up form so that's all we have to do now this command is going to take some time to execute so i actually already did this beforehand but if you haven't which i'm assuming you haven't pause the video and wait till it's done executing and then you can resume watching now once you execute this command what you should have is a sign up form folder react app that is living inside of whatever directory you created it in. In this case, it's in my desktop. So if you did something like CD sign up app, you should be able to see it. Awesome. Now, once that's done, open up that folder inside of your favorite text editor. I'm using VS code, which is by far the most popular text editor in the planet right now. So I went ahead and I opened it up. And as you can see, we have a pretty boilerplate React application. I do expect you to be relatively familiar with what's going on here. Right here, we have this app component and it's just rendering, you know, this React, learn React uh, anchor tag. It has a paragraph over here and has an image right over here that shows the logo. So very, very simple component and it's being rendered inside of the index.js as you can see here. Now, one thing that I want to inspect is this file right over here, app.test.js. So it appears as though that this is a test file that is testing the app.js component. And that's exactly what is happening. Typically, when we're utilizing React testing library, this is the naming convention. So the component that we're testing, .test.js. So let's actually go ahead and click into it and let's just look at what's happening here. Now we're not going to actually look into the test part a little bit later. We'll dissect that in future videos. But right now what I want to focus in on is this right over here. So we're importing something called render and screen from at testing library dash react. So it seems by default, React is utilizing testing library. So we don't have to do any installation, any configuration ourselves. By default, it is actually already being used. So if we went to our package.json and we looked at all of the dependencies, you can see that, well, that's actually what's happening. You can see that, yes, we have testing library. We have, um, we have testing library dash react, testing library dash user event. We have testing library dash just DOM. So it's already installed. And what's nice about it is we don't have to do any initial configuration. Now, if we look at the scripts, you can see, of course, we have the start script, the build script, but we also have a test script. So we have a script that we can run to run all of our tests. So let's actually go ahead and do that. I'm going to open up my terminal. And I'm going to do npm run test and just to see what happens. And there we go. We get this over here. I'm going to say a to run all tests. You might not get this. And you can see that it is going to detect this test file app.test.js. And right now we have one passing test. So what's happening here is when we run app npm run test, it's going to look for all of the files that have this structure, the app.test.js, and then it's going to go ahead and run them. Now, inside of the app.test.js, we have one test and it is passing. And again, we'll look at the test itself a little bit later, but for now, you can see that we do just have one test and, well, it's passing. Renders uh, uh, learn React link, it's passing. And as you can see, this is that test. Awesome. So one other thing that I want to note is that React testing library uses another library called Jest under the hood. So it's Jest is a very popular testing library and React testing library is utilizing that to build this React testing framework. So right over here, if we were to go back to our package.json, you can see that we also have this dependency right here, Jest DOM. All right, so I hope that makes sense. And now that we have a good understanding of the file structure for React application, let's actually move on and start utilizing React testing library. In order to start using React testing library properly, we first need to understand one of the main React testing library philosophies. And to do this, let's take a quick look at what we're trying to build and test. 
So over here, we're trying to build a form and obviously this form has quite a bit of functionality to it. Now, of course, when we want to build this form, we have to go ahead and code it out. So let's say that over here we have this person and he went ahead and coded out some logic and it ended up in this form. It ended up resulting in this form with its functionality, its error handling functionality. Now this is awesome and it's behaving exactly the way that we want. However, one thing that I want to note is that we can also have multiple people code out the exact same thing, but with different logic. So you can see here that it's different color representing different logic. For example, this person over here, they could have used use state to handle all of the inputs. Whereas this person, maybe they just got the e.target.value and directly utilize that to handle the inputs as well as the error handling. So the implementation might be different. However, across all of these people and across all of these code bases, the ultimate outcome and the ultimate design is exactly the same. The software app behaves the exact same way that we intended, regardless of the different implementation details. And React Testing Library says that regardless of how these things have been implemented, the tests should always pass. And the reason for this is we will never focus on the implementation details when testing our React application, but rather we're going to test how the software should actually work. So for example, we're going to test that we should type into this. We should be able to type into this input. We should be able, if we input something incorrectly and hit submit, we should see this error. How we get there, React Testing Library doesn't care. It just tests the outcome of the software product. So that is a rule that we are going to follow. We're always going to test how the software is meant to be used, not how it's implemented. And that is a very, very important philosophy that you need to understand when utilizing React Testing Library and you know what, any testing framework for that matter. Let's go ahead and write our very first test. Now remember what we want to do. We want to test the behavior of the app that we built, not the implementation details. Now, if I get this form as a user, what do I expect to happen? Well, for one, let's start with the very simplest thing. I expect a user to be able to type into these inputs. And once they type into the inputs, the value is present in that input. So let's actually write a test that tests whether a, a user can actually type into the email, password, and confirm password inputs. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, we're going to take a test-driven development approach to do this. So the first thing that we're going to do is write a test that tests that we can type into the input. And then we are going to code out that feature until the test passes. So let's go ahead and do it right now. Now, in order to do this, let's actually go into our app.test.js file and let's actually inspect this test over here. We're going to look at the structure of this test. So a test is written by using the test keyword. And this is something that we go ahead and invoke. So we have test and we go ahead and we invoke it. And what this takes in is two parameters. The first parameter is going to be a string. And this is going to describe what this test is testing. For example, over here, the string is says, hey, this is going to render a react link. This is testing that this component, the app component renders a react link. So over here, we can write anything that we want to describe our test. So I'm just going to say description over here for now. And then as the second parameter, we're going to have a callback function. So a callback function. And inside of this callback function, we're going to have all of our test logic. Now, what is going to go inside of this callback function? Well, typically, these three steps will always occur in any callback function that we have. So the first step, as you can see here, is we're calling a function called render, and we are passing in the app component. 
So this render thing is we're getting that from right over here from the add testing library slash react library. So we're getting it auto imported from here. And then what we're doing is again, we're passing the app component, which we're getting from the app.js file. So the app.js file is over here, which is our app component. All right. So what is this doing? Well, this is going to render that component into the virtual DOM. And it's only going to render that component in any children that it has. Anything else, any parents are not going to be rendered. So it's going to render that component in the virtual DOM. And once it's in the virtual DOM, we can start testing it. So this is going to be basically rendering the component that we want to test. So rendering the component we want to test. We want to test. Awesome. So that's the very first step. And then the second step over here, you can see what we're doing is we're finding a specific element inside of this component. So right here, we're doing screen, which we're getting from uh, at testing library. And we're saying dot get by text. So screen has a bunch of methods that we can utilize to find elements. And we'll talk about all of them in great detail a little bit later. But over here, we have screen dot get by text. And then we have a regular expression. So right here, this is a regular expression. And so it's going to find the element that has the text that matches this regular expression. So if we were to go to the app.js file and we want to find the element that has the text learn react, well, over here, it's right over here. So we have this anger tag right over here that has learn react. So what this is going to do is get us that anchor tag. So it's going to get us that anchor tag. So over here, step two is finding the elements, finding the elements that we want to find. So finding the elements. And then the last step in this case is an assertion. So this right here is the final thing that is going to assert what we want in our test. So here, what we're doing is we're expecting that this anchor tag is going to be inside of the document. And so this is what, what is either going to fail or pass. So if this anchor tag is not in the document, well, this assertion is going to fail and thus this test will fail. If it is in the document, well, this assertion is going to pass and thus it will pass. The test will pass. So over here, we have an assertion. And what's nice is we can have multiple assertions within one test block. So this right here is known as a test block. This over here is another test block. And we can have multiple assertions within a test block. And if just one of them fails, the whole test fails. So just to quickly take a look at this, let's go ahead and open up our terminal. And let's run those, let's run these tests again. So over here, you can see now we have two passing tests. You might be wondering, why do we have two passing tests? Well, we have now one test here, and then we have another test here. And even though we're doing absolutely nothing in here, it is still passing. Well, why is that? The only way we can get a test to fail is if an error is thrown. And so, you know, if a, an assertion is false or fails, then an error is thrown. But right now, because we're not doing anything, everything seems fine. And so the test passes. So let's actually just get rid of this test real quick. I'm going to get rid of it. And you can see now we have one test pass. And now what I want to do is I want to comment this out right over here. So let's comment out. Let me zoom out a little bit. So I'm going to comment out this anchor tag. So let's say we commented out this anchor tag. And now notice that this test should fail. There we go. And why is that? Well, if we were to scroll up all the way up here, it says that, hey, we're unable to find an element with the text learn react. And then over here, it says that it's maybe whatever. And what is what's really nice is that it also gives us uh, an HTML tree of our component. So we can actually kind of dig around and we can look and we can see, well, yeah, it's right. There is no learn react uh, anchor tag. 
So we can go just go ahead and uh, uncomment this out. And if you were to uncomment it out, it should pass. And there we go. Awesome. So now that we know the structure of a test, let's go ahead and um, well, let's go ahead and write our first test. All right, my good friends in this video, what we're going to do is go ahead and finally code out our very first test. So what I went ahead and did is I went to the app.test.js file and I removed everything aside from these import statements right over here. And now let's go to our app.js and then everything inside of the div element, let's get rid of it. And let's also get rid of this class name. So we just start with a very clean slate. So what is it that we want to test? Well, I know I said that we're going to test whether we can type into an input element, but I think our very first test should be a little bit simpler. So initially when a user sees this form, what do they expect to be inside of these inputs? Well, nothing. So let's write a test that tests whether initially all of the input elements are empty. So that is what we are going to write. So in order to do this, let's go to our test file. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a test block. So we're going to say test, and then we're going to give our test a name, a description. So that's going to say inputs should be initially empty. So this is what we're testing for. And then we're going to have our callback and then our callback is going to have our logic. So what's the first thing that we need to do? Well, we need to render the component that we are going to be testing inside of our virtual DOM. So we're going to call render. And then in here, we're going to pass in the component. We have to pass in the component in the JSX form. So we're going to say app like this. All right. Awesome. So that's the very, very first step. Now, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to find these input elements to go ahead and query for them. Now, how do we do that? This is probably the tougher part. So in order to learn how to do this, let's actually look at the documentation and let's see what it says. So I'll link this uh, page in the description if you want to see it. I'll have it attached to this video. Um, but essentially what this is going to state is how we can query for specific elements inside of our virtual DOM. So if we scroll down over here, you can see that there's actually multiple ways that we can query for single elements and multiple ways that we can query for multiple elements. So we can use get by something, or we could use query by something or we could use find by something. And we'll talk about what these some things are. Or we can, if you want to query for multiple elements, we can do get all by or query all by and then or find all by. But right now what we want to do is focus in on just these single elements because that's exactly what we want to query for. We want to query for, if we go over here, we want to query for, and let's present this. We want to query for this element and then we want to separately query for this one and we want to separately query for this one because they're all uh, separate and we want to test for different things for all of them. So let's go ahead and let's figure out how we can do this. Well, what do we want to use? Do we want to use get by query by or find by? So let's go over here and let's look at this table. So this table is going to describe the differences between get by query by and find by. So get by, if it doesn't find any elements, what it does is it throws an error and it causes the test to fail. So that is what get by does. So if it does find something, what ends up happening is it returns the element. And if it finds more than one match, it throws an error and it causes the test to fail. And get by cannot be used asynchronously. So we cannot use async and await. So if we're rendering a uh, component asynchronously and we want to test for it, well, we cannot utilize get by. So let's just quick take a quick uh, uh, reminder of what it does. So if it's zero elements, does not find the match, it throws an error. If it finds one element, it's going to return it. If it finds multiple elements that 
uh, um, meet this description, it's going to throw an error and it, we cannot utilize async await. Now over here, let's move on to query by. So query by is pretty much the same as get by, except there are differences when there's zero matches. When there are zero matches, it doesn't throw an error. It just returns null. So if we are trying to test for the lack of a UI element in our component, then we want to use query by rather than get by. And then the rest is exactly the same. Lastly, let's talk about find by. Find by behaves the exact same way as get by, except we're able to utilize it with elements that uh, uh, render asynchronously. And so it's going to behave over here exactly the same, but when we need to utilize async await for an element, we can utilize find by except for get by. And multiple elements work exactly the same way. So over here, get all by, if we don't have any elements, what it's going to do is throw an error. If we have one match or multiple matches, it's going to return an array. Then over here, we cannot utilize async await. Query by, if we don't have any elements, it's just gonna return an empty array. And then over here, it's gonna behave the same way and we cannot utilize async await. And then find all by is gonna behave exactly the same uh, with get all by, but we can utilize async await. Awesome. So I hinted that we have here get by, and then we have three dots, get by something. So what is this something? Well, let's actually scroll down over here and we can actually look at all of the different ways that we can get by or query by or find by. So over here, you can see we can either get by role and anything that we can get by, we can also query by and find by. So we can also do find by role, query by role. But for example, for this example, they're just using get by. So we can get by role, we can get by label text, we can get by placeholder text, we can get by text, we can get by display value, we can get by alt text, by, uh, by title, and we can also get by test ID. But which one do we want to utilize? Well, if we go over here, you can see that we have some priorities. And it says here that based on the guiding principles, your test should resemble how a user interacts with your code as much as possible. And so what you want to do is you want to use roles that reflect the experience of a visual mouse user, as well as those that use assistive technologies like screen readers. So if I were to go back over here to my, uh, my form, well, I'm probably going to look at this form and I'm going to see this and I'm going to look at the role of this element and the role of this element right over here is a text box role. And that is how I am going to perceive it. So it's highly, uh, uh, it's much better that our tests do the exact same and we get the element by the role rather than something like the test ID, which is not seen by the user and screen readers cannot see at all. At all. So again, what we want to do is we want to make our test as similar as a user experience as possible. So if we can, we, we are gonna utilize get by role. If we cannot utilize get by role, we're gonna utilize get by label text, which is the second one. And this is also a really good method. And then over here, we could also use get by placeholder text, which is also a very good one. Get by text itself is pretty good. And then if we cannot utilize any one of these, we're gonna move on to the semantic queries such as get by alt text and get by title and things like this, like the alt text, even though uh, some users can't see it, at least you know assistive technologies like screen re readers can see it. And then the last thing, the last option, if we cannot utilize anything else, we're gonna use test ID. And test ID is we assign a test ID to a particular element and then we just get that element by test ID. But again, a user can't see that, nor can assistive reading technologies. So this is our last resort. Now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and query for this email input element. 
So in order to do this, what we're gonna do is first create a variable, and we're gonna call this, well, email input element. Very, very simple. And then we're gonna say that that is equal to screen, and then we're gonna do screen dot. And then we can see all of the different query methods that we can utilize. Now we're gonna utilize get by. So we're gonna say get by. And as you can see, now we see all of the get by query methods that we can utilize. Well, which one do we want to use? Well, semantically, the best thing that we can use is get by role because this really matches the user's behavior and it also is best for screen readers. So we're gonna say get by role. Now the role is going to represent the role of the element that uh, we're trying to query by. So let's go ahead and invoke this, and then we need to specify the role. The best way to do this is to just put quotes in here, and then you can just go ahead and scroll through all of the different roles. Now, off the top of your head, you might not know exactly what role your element is, um, what role your element has. So the best thing to do is just to do a quick Google search. Or if you don't do know what it is, like I do, I know that we're trying to query for the input element that has a role of text box. So we're gonna say the text box role. So I'm gonna go ahead and query for this. Now, one thing that I wanna note is I wanna quickly run my test before I save this, I wanna run my test. And initially it's going to pass because there's nothing that's throwing an error. Now, if I were to save this, and we can see here that it has failed. And the reason why it failed is that it can't find any element that has the role text box. And that's because if we go to our app.js, there's absolutely nothing in here at the moment. And this makes sense because remember, remember, if we go over here, get by, if it doesn't find any element, it's gonna throw an error. And, then, and if an error is thrown inside of a test block, that causes the test to fail. Okay, awesome. So that is finding the element. Now what we want to do is the assertion. So we expect this input element initially to have a value that is completely empty. So what we can do here is have an expect statement and then in here we can say that we expect that the email input element, so that the email input element dot value, and then here we can say dot to be, and then just an empty set of strings. So this is the assertion that we want. And if you're wondering, you know, how I got to be, how I got dot value, this is all going to come with, uh, to you once you write more and more tests. So we're going to expect that the email input element dot value is going to have a empty string. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, save this. And now, well, we should still expect this test to fail. Because remember, we're following a test driven development approach. So now what we need to do is to write out the code to make this test pass. And let's do that in the next video. Let's now go ahead and write out the code to make our tests pass. So as you can see here, very, very sad test. We are failing. It is red. Let's make it green. So in order to do this, just for styling purposes, we're going to utilize Bootstrap. So let's go over to getbootstrap.com and I'll have this attached to the video. And what you can do is you can just go to get started. And then over here, just copy this link right here. And once you're in there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the public. We're gonna go to index.html and we're just gonna throw that link in there. That's all we have to do to set up Bootstrap for styling purposes. This isn't really anything test related. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, let's start creating the elements that we need to make this test pass. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep this div, except I'm gonna give it a class name of container, and we're also gonna give it a margin top, so margin y of five. So this gives it a margin top and bottom, margin Y. All right, so that's the very first thing. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a form. So that's what we're gonna do. 
And then inside of this form, we are going to have a div. So over here, we're going to have a div and we're going to give this div a class of MB three. So we're going to have some margin in the bottom. And then inside of this div, we are going to have a label. So a label, and this is going to be for the email. And we're also going to give this a class name that is equal to form label. Again, just some bootstrap classes. And over here, we're going to call this label email address. So email address. Awesome. So, well, right now we still didn't do anything and the test should fail because we don't have that input element. So as you can see, it still fails. So now over here, right under the label, let's go ahead and create that input element. Okay. Let's just zoom in once more. I'm just worried that sometimes, uh, it gets a little bit small. So let's add an input element and we're going to give this a type of email. Let's also give it an ID of email and we're going to give it a name of email. And lastly, we're going to give it a class name and we're going to say that that class name is equal to form control. All right. And that's pretty much it. This is the bare minimum amount of code that we need to get our test to pass. Because right now we have our input element that has the role of text box and that initially should be empty. So let's go ahead and let's open up our terminal again and let's go over to our test. And as you can see, now our tests pass. We made great progress. However, this test is not complete. Remember what this test is supposed to do. It's supposed to test that all input elements should initially be empty. Right now, we're only testing that the email input element is empty. So we have to do the same thing for the password input element, as well as the confirm password input element. And the process of doing this is going to be exactly the same. The only difficult part is querying for those elements. Now you might be thinking, well, okay, well, what I could do is something like a const password input element, and I can say screen by, and I can say get by role, and I can then say text box. Well, that's not going to work. And it's not going to work for multiple reasons. The first reason is that we're already querying for a text box and that should be the input email element. Now, remember what happens when we have multiple matches for a specific query, when we utilize get by, it's going to throw an error. So what we need to do is we need to find a more unique way to find this password element. Now, even if, even if we went ahead and commented this line out over here, and then we went to our app.js and instead of changing this input element to be an email and we made it be a password, it is still going to fail. Let's actually take a look at it. So we need to go here. We need to change the password input element. And you might be thinking, well, this should definitely work. We do have an input type right here and we should be able to get that and then assert that it is initially nothing. However, when we scroll down here, it is failing. And why is it failing? If you scroll all the way up, you can see here that there is no element that has the role of text box which well, that makes no sense. We, we just had it before. All we did is we changed the type. Well, that right there actually changed the role of the input. And this is kind of a nuance and something that is tricky to kind of get over. The main reason why I figured this out is I went ahead and I researched it and I found here in this uh, GitHub issue, that in order to retrieve as uh, in order to retrieve a password, a password has no implicit role. So we're going to have to use something else called get by label text. So you can see here that every div element that contains an input has a label and then it also has an input and that label right over here is attached to this input 
with the for attribute and then the ID attribute. And that's exactly what we had right over here. Let's, let's move this back to email. We had this label that says HTML4. And then over here, we have this ID on the input that is email. And so now we're linking this label to this input. So what we can do is we can create another div element that has a that has a password input type and a label, and then we can get that input type by its label. So let's go ahead and do that. So in order to do that, let's go over here and let's just go back to our previous versions. And what we're going to do here is we're going to get by label text. So we're going to get by label text. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to utilize a regular expression for this. So we can either say we want the text to be password like this, and therefore it's going to have to match this exactly, including the capitalization, or we could just use a regular expression that says, well, the label should have the word password in it. Doesn't matter where it is. Doesn't matter if you have multiple words in there, as long as we have password and it doesn't really matter if it's capitalized or not. So we're going to use a regular expression. So we're going to get the input element that is going to have a label of password. And then we're also going to do the same assertion. So remember, we can have multiple assertions inside of the same test. So we're going to say here, expect and we're going to expect that the password input element, we're going to expect its value. So we're going to get the value attribute from the input element. We're going to expect it dot to be, and this is outside of the expect, and we're going to expect it to be empty initially. Let's go ahead and save that. And let's go here, open up our terminal. Oops, 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 oops. And initially, this test should fail. Now, even though this expect statement passes, this one fails, causing the whole test block to fail. All right, let's go ahead and go to our app.js file. And I am going to, uh, let's, let's uh, zoom out. Hopefully, it's not too small for you guys. So in here, what we're going to do is we're going to just simply very uh, copy this right here. We're going to paste that in there. We're going to change this to password. We're going to change the, um, the HTML4 to password. We're going to change this right here to password, the type to password. We're going to change the ID to password. And we're going to change the name to password. So let's go ahead and save that. And there we go. Now it is green. So the last thing that we have to do is go to our app.test.js and test for the confirm password. Now, what we can do is the exact same thing. I'm going to go ahead and type it out. So we're going to say const password input element. And we're going to say screen dot get by label text. And this time we're going to have a regular expression that is going to say confirm password confirm password. All right, so we're going to have that in there. And we're going to also expect that to be null. So we're going to say uh, password or over here, this should probably be confirm password, confirm password input element. So let's copy that, let's paste that in there, we're going to expect its value dot to be initially empty. Of course, once we run this, it's going to fail. So let's go over here. Let's just check it out. Yes, it failed. And now let's go to our app.js and let's make it pass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very simply copy this, paste that in there. In here, I'm going to say confirm password. And then I'm going to I'm going to save this. Now, what do you guys think is going to happen? Is this going to fail or pass? I'm trying to like quickly not show you guys what happens. What do you think will happen here? Will this fail or pass? Well, if you said fail, then you are correct. It, well, it passed. I'm actually a little surprised that that passed. And the reason why that passed is let's make this confirm password. 
And then let's go over here. I kind of ruined the suspense there. Let's do confirm password and then confirm password. So let's go ahead and save that. And this should fail. So let's go here. And now why do you think that this failed? Well, let's actually scroll all the way up right over here. And it says, so it says that, hey, we just found multiple elements that match this regular expression. And the reason for this is because if you look at the label, this label over here has password. And then this label over here, even though it has confirmed password, it also has password. And so it matches that regular expression. And remember, when we have multiple elements, when we utilize get by, it's going to throw an error. So in order to fix this, what we can do here is remove the regular expression and just simply say, we want to find an element that has a label that has the string password and just the string password, nothing else, no confirmed password, no, uh, uh, the capitalization does matter and that should work. So if we were to go ahead and save this, it passes. All right, so, well, congrats. We uh, wrote our very first test and it's actually a pretty sophisticated test. We're actually doing quite a lot. So that's awesome. And now let's actually move on to more complicated tests in the next videos. Now that we got one test out of the way, let's go ahead and write another. So what test do we want to write? Well, I want to test that we have the ability to type into these input elements. So if I were to type something in, it should be inside of the input element that I typed into. So that is what I want to test. So let's go ahead and test this. So the first thing that we want to do, of course, is create a new test block because this is testing something completely different. And what we're going to say here, is we're going to give this test a name and this should uh, say something like should be able to type an email type an email and then we're going to have our callback function and in our callback function we're going to render our app component so let's go ahead and do that and now what we want to do is we want to get the email input element so let's go ahead and copy this and we're going to paste it in there and actually right here we can do one better so what we can do is we can get by role the text box as well as get by label text so we can have both queries simultaneously in order to do this what we can do is pass in an object as the second param and then we can say name and then over here we can have our our, uh, our regular expression so what this is doing is getting by the role text box and it's ensuring that the label text is email. So now we're having these two simultaneous queries that ensures that we're getting the correct text box because we can have multiple text boxes within our component. All right, so that is the first element. And now what we want to do is we want to type into this element. Now, how do we do that? Well, what we're doing here is trying to simulate a browser interaction inside of our test. And we can actually do that by going into our package.json. So let's go into our package.json and we can do that by utilizing this library that was already installed for us. Testing dash library and then slash user event. And what this does is it simulates user events that could occur by a user in the browser. And if we actually went to the documentation, I'll have this attached to the video, you can see all of the events that we can utilize. We can utilize a click event and over here it has an example. So over here we have this element right here. And what we're doing is user event dot click. And then we're going to click this element right over here. As you can see, we also have a double click. We also have type. Well, this is something that we're going to use type. There's also keyboard options, upload, clear, etc. There's many, many different things like hover and unhover. Now, what we want to do is we want to utilize type. 
So in order to do this, what we need to do is import user event from uh, add testing library slash user events. So let's go here. We're going to import that in. So let's import it right here. And then in here, we're going to say user event dot whatever event we want type in this case. And then we need to provide it with the element we want that event to occur in. So we want this to occur in the email input element. And then as the second parameter, we're going to provide it with, well, what we want to type. In this case, we want to type in an email. So we can say Selena at gmail.com. And the last thing that we need to do is the assertion. So now what we need to do is expect, and then we need to say expect that the email input element dot value and we expect it to be, well, we expect it to be this right over here. Now this is going to be one of the rare cases where the test will pass even before we have implemented the code, because by default, we should be able to type into an element and that should change the value of that input element. Now you might be thinking, well, if by default, that's how it works, then why in the world do we even care about this test? Well, later on in the course, not to spoil anything, but I guess I will, we're going to be adding two way binding to our input element. So we're going to be storing the input value inside of our state. And then the value of the input is also going to be our state. So we're going to have basic two way binding. So we're going to have here something like value is equal to, well, whatever that uh, uh, state is. So we need to actually make sure that we're able to, when we update our input element, we also update that state. Because for example, if it stays empty like this, if it stays empty like this, well, in that case, our test is going to fail. And uh, well, that means that this test was actually useful in catching that error. So that is just foreshadowing what we're gonna do in the future. And well, this is the first test that we wrote with user events. Welcome to your very first do it on your own section. So what I want you to do on your own, so pause the video, of course, is to do similar tests to what we've done over here, but also for the password and confirm password. So I want to have two separate test blocks that test that we are able to type into the password field and well, that should change the value of this input element. And then another test block that tests that we should be able to type into the confirm password. And this should change the value of this input element. So go ahead and try that on your own. You can use the other tests as references. So I'll give you guys a quick five seconds to pause the video and try it on your own. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the explanation. So five, four, three, two, one. All right. So let's go ahead and let's do this right now. So the first thing is, is we need to have another test block. And we're going to say that this test block is, well, we should be able to type a password should be able to type a password and then we're going to have our callback and then in here we're going to have a render we're going to render our app component and then what we're going to do is well we want to get that password element that password input element so we're going to say const password uh, input element and what we're going to do is we're going to do screen dot get by and we're going to get by label text and we're going to say password because we can't do a regular expression for this because we have multiple elements that have a label text of password within the text itself. So we're just going to do the regular string for this. So now once we get it, well, I want to type. So I'm going to say user event dot type. And then I'm going to say password input element, and I'm going to type in my password of password exclamation mark. The last thing I want to do is the assertion. So I'm going to say expect, and I'm going to expect that the password input element, its value to be, well, password with an exclamation point. 
And again, this is one of the rare cases where the test will pass because of course we are, we, by default, we're able to type into the password. So as you can see here, it passes. All right, now let's do the exact same thing for the confirm password. So let's go here and we should, we should be able to con or type, we should be able to type a confirm password. We're gonna go here and we are going to, well, we need to first get that element. I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste it this time. So let's go ahead here, let's copy and paste that just so we can speed this up a little bit. And then what we're gonna do is a user event dot, uh, and we're gonna do a user event dot type. And we're gonna do confirm password input element. We're gonna type in password exclamation mark. And then what we're gonna do is expect that the confirm password input element dot value dot to be, well, password exclamation mark. So now if we were to save this, we should have another passing test. And we don't actually. So why is that failing? Well, over here it's saying that it's not able to find the, the label text of confirm password. Okay, I wonder why that is. <laughs> okay, and I know exactly why that is. And that's because we're not rendering the component inside of our test. So let's go here and let's render the app component. So now we should have a passing test. Now is the time to start working on some more complicated tests. Specifically, we're gonna start testing the error handling capability of our form. So for example, if someone put in an invalid email and clicked on the submit button, we should see this message right over here saying that the email you input is invalid. So you know what, let's just get right into it. Now this is gonna be a separate test. So we're gonna say here, a new test block. And for the, uh, the title of the text, exactly what this, or description of the test, we're gonna say that this should show error or email error message on invalid email. All right. So in here, the first thing of course that we need to do is render our component that we want to test, which in this case is the app component. The next thing is, well, we need to type into this input element. So that's the next thing that we need to do. So of course to do that, what we need is to get the input element. So let's go over here and let's find that input element right here. Awesome, let's find that. And we're gonna go ahead and we're going to um, put that in there. And then we're gonna do user event dot type. And then we're gonna say input email element. And then what we're gonna say is you want to type an invalid email. So we're gonna say Salima, Selena. Uh, but then we're gonna forget about the at sign or we're just gonna say gmail.com. That's that's pretty invalid to me. So we can say user uh, user event dot type and then the element itself and then an invalid email. You can put whatever email you want in here. And then what, what do we want to do? What's the next step to get this error? Well, what we wanna do is we want to click on this button right over here. Now this button doesn't exist at the moment but it will, and it's gonna be the only button inside of this component. So what we can do here is we can get this button by role. So we can say submit button, and then or we can call it element as well, might as well. Submit button element, or we can go screen dot get by role, and well, this has the role of button. And this should get the button uh, inside of uh, the only the only button inside of our form. Now, if you want to be more specific, of course, we can go here and add the name, and we can say that this is going to be submit. And let's actually do that. All right, that's awesome. So now, what we want to do is we want to click on this button. So over here, we're going to say user event dot click, and we're going to click on the submit button element. All right, so now what we wanna do is assert that this error is present in the document. 
So what we can do here is we can get that error. So we can say email error element, and we can get it by text because it's going to be just a normal p tag. So we can say here screen dot get by text. And then over here, we can have a template literal. And over here, we can say the email you input is invalid. Okay, so the email you input is invalid. So now once we get it, we want to assert that well, this is present inside of the document. So what we can very simply do is expect email error element. So email error element to be so dot to be in the document. And this right here is a matcher that tests well, is this present inside of the document. And of course, you can look at all of the different matchers that we have. Uh, but you, what, you, what we can also do is we can go to this just documentation, and it shows you all of the DOM based uh, matchers. So over here, maybe we have a button that's disabled. So we can test if it's disabled by doing to be disabled over here to be enabled to be empty, to have class to, to, to be visible to be checked. So there's a bunch of, uh, you know, DOM based matchers that we can utilize. I'm going to be utilizing again, uh, to be in the document because well, it's not going to be in the document. If uh, well, the error is not there. Okay, awesome. So we're going to say expect this to be in the document to be to be in the document. And that's pretty much the error. One thing that we could also do is test that initially this error isn't present. And only once we input an invalid email and then click submit, well, that's when it's present. So we can actually have two different assertions at different locations in the code. So in order to do this, what we can do is we can copy this over here. And we can put it right at the very top. And we can just do an expect right at the very top. So we can say expect, and we expect that this element right over here, and over here, what we can do is say to not to be in the document, to be in the document. So by, uh, by having this not in the middle, what it's doing is it's just flipping everything. Now, one thing that is going to happen is even if we coded this out and everything is working fine as expected, this test will always fail. And the reason why is because we're using get by text. And remember when we don't have an element, which we are expecting initially, um, what ends up happening is this throws an error. So what we need to do is we need to change this to query by, and then we assert that it is not initially in the document. And then of course, we're going to do some of the user um, interactions, we're going to type and then submit. And then we expect it to be in a document. And just for organization's sake, let's actually move all of these variables up here. Okay, let's also move this one. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. So that's, that's pretty, that's a lot cleaner. In my opinion, we have all our, our things here, we expect it initially to not be in a document. And then we have these two user events, and then we expect it to be in the document. So I think this is a really, really good test. Let me fix that. Oh my goodness, what's going on with these extra letters? All right, so let's save that. And of course, this is going to fail in so many different ways. Uh, but uh, let's actually go ahead and code out a solution in the next section. So we wrote the test. Now let's write the implementation to make the test pass. So the first thing that I want to do is right at the bottom, I want to add that button. So inside of the form, but after this div, this last div over here, let's add a button. And then in here, we're going to give this button type submit. So type is equal to submit. And then in here, we're going to say submit. All right, awesome. So that is the button. So we added the button and now in our test, we should be able to successfully query for this button that has the role of button, of course, and it has the text of submit. 
But now what we want to do is we want to display any errors that might occur. So in order to do this, what we need to do is somehow get the value that we put inside of our input inside of some state in our React application. Now, the best way to manage state in a component level is to use use state. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import use state. So I'm going to import use state from React. So let's go ahead and do that. And now we got use state. And so in here, what we're going to do is we're going to say const and we're going to say uh, sign up input. And then over here, we're going to say set sign up input. And this is going to be equal to use state. And initially, it's just going to be an object. So it's going to be an object where the email is an empty string. And then we're also going to have the password be an empty string. And then over here, we're going to have our confirm password to also be an empty string. Now, again, the reason why we're doing this is that we want to do two way binding. So whatever this state is over here is going to be the value of this input. And anytime we update and change the input, we're going to update the state. So let's just do the one way binding where the input over here is going to be whatever this is. So we're going to say here value. And then we're going to say value is equal to and we're going to say value is equal to sign up input dot email. Now, let's say that we actually did this and we forgot to do the two way binding with the on change. Let's actually go ahead and open up our terminal. So let's open up our terminal and let's see what happens. So let's go here. Let's go here. So right now we have that one failing test. That makes sense. That's the one that we just wrote. But if I went ahead and saved this, and we forgot about this and we thought, okay, everything is fine. Well, our tests are going to tell us that everything is not fine. So we should have an, an additional failing test. If this, there we go. So we have an additional failing test and that's going to be the test of, um, where is it? Where is it? So yeah. So the, well, this one is the one that we just wrote. Well, this one right here. So it should be able to type an email. Well, right now we can't type an email because the email is always going to be an empty string. So we're not going to be able to change the value. So in order to make this test pass, we need to have an on change handler and we're going to give this a function called handle change. So we're going to give this a function called handle change. And then in here, what we're going to do is we're going to do a const handle change. And this is just basic react two way binding. We're going to get the event. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do set uh, the sign up input. So we're going to set the sign up input and we're going to make that equal to an object. And what we're going to do is we're going to destructure out everything inside of we're going to or we're going to spread everything inside of the sign up input, except we want to change the email in this case to whatever e dot target dot value is. Now, because what we want to do is you want to utilize this uh, handle change throughout both the uh, the email and the password and the confirm password. What we can do here is utilize the name. So the name here says email, which matches this right over here. So what we can do is we can say that we want to utilize the property e dot target dot name. And then this is going to resolve to the email when we change the email. And we want this to be e.target.value. And we don't even have to test if this works. What we can do is just simply rely on our tests. So if our tests pass, then everything should be okay. Well, I mean, well, that one test will fail, but we should only have one test failing rather than two. So let's wait. It's taking extra long these days, or I'm, I'm not scrolled down. <laughs> Uh, but you can see here. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So now we are able to type into it and now we have this two way binding. And so what we can do very simply now is actually copy this and paste it in here, but change this to password. And over here we can do the exact same thing and we can change this to confirm password. Now, if there's, now this will actually result in an error because as you can see, the name here is not uh, a confirmed password. So we should get an additional error here. 
So what we can do to fix this is just very simply change the name to confirm password like so. All right, awesome. But this is something that I caught right away. However, it could be something that you don't catch that the, that the test did catch. All right, so now that we have that, now we have the two-way binding, what we want to do is we want to uh, validate the email when we click this button. So when we submit this form, we want to validate the email. So right over here, let's add another handler and we're going to say handler and let's actually wait, give it a little bit of classes here. So I'll say BTN, BTN primary. And then we're also going to give it an on click. So we're going to give it an on click and this is going to be handle click handle click. All right. And then over here, this is where we're going to have our const handle click. And here is where we're going to validate all of our, um, all of our inputs. So the first thing that we would want to do is get the target and prevent the default behavior. So let's just do E dot prevent default. We're going to go ahead and invoke that. And then what we want to do is right now, let's go ahead and get the email and validate that it's actually a real email. So what we can say is we can use some sort of regular expression to validate the email. So let's actually go on the internet and say how to validate an email, an email in JS. Let's, let's, let's see how we can do that. That's pretty, it's a pretty tough thing to do. Maybe if we can find a stack overflow for this, it'll be a lot easier stack over flow. So let's go here. Best way to validate an email. Let me zoom in here for you guys. So this person is saying, uh, well, let's use this crazy regular expression to validate an email. Honestly, we could use this and this is one implementation detail that we could utilize, but I don't think this is a very good approach. And the reason why I don't think this is a good approach is because there are libraries out there that do these things and they're very, very popular and if we just do this, we're kind of reinventing the wheel. So instead, let's actually go to Google and search for um, email or maybe validator. So validator and then JavaScript. So if we search for that, then what we are going to get is a library called, I actually can't find it here, but there's a library called validator that can actually do these stuff for us. So maybe if I did validator NPM, I'll find it. There we go. So you can see here that there's an extremely popular library. Let me zoom in here for you guys. That gets almost 6.4 million um, downloads every every day, and it does exactly what we want. So we want uh, validator dot is email. We pass it the email, and it either returns true or false. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I use a regular expression or a library. The implementation doesn't matter. What what matters is how how the user interface and how the interactions um, occur in, in, in real life. And so that is what matters. So we don't care about the implementation details. So let's go ahead and install this library. So validator, we're going to open up a new terminal window and we're going to do npm install. And we're going to do validator. And let's go here and let's just wait. So while that downloads, what we can do is we can import validator. So we can say import validator from, and we can just say validator. I might need to restart my computer after this because it's acting extremely slow. All right, let's just wait. I think it's because I have Docker running to be quite frank. Maybe I should probably get rid of Docker. Okay, so let's just wait, wait, wait. And there we go. So now we got that. And so here, what we can do is have an, uh, a check. So we can say if, and then here we can say if the, uh, we can do validator dot is email. And then we can pass in the signup input dot email. 
And what we want to do is we want to check if this is not an email, then what we want to do is we want to throw an error. So, okay, so well, what's the error? So we can actually create another piece of state here and we can say const and we can say error. And then here we can say set error. And then over here we can say use state and initially that error is going to be an empty string. So here what we can do is we can return set error and we can say, well, what the error message that we want to say. So what was the error message? It was this right over uh, this right over here. So the email you input is invalid. So you can say here the email you input is invalid. So that is what we want to set. And so lastly, right at the very bottom, what we can do is we can have a P tag that shows that error only if we have an error. So we can say error and then and, and then we can have our P tag. Let's have our P tag in here. And then here we're just going to display the error. So if the error is not an empty string and there's actually an error, well, we're going to display this uh, p tag with that error. However, if it is an empty string, then that resolves to falsy and we don't see this p tag. So this should work. So the last thing that I want to do is just maybe give this a little bit of styling so it's nice and red. So let's say class name and we're going to say text danger. So without even running this, what I can do is open up my uh, terminal, see the tests and hopefully everything should pass. And no, it doesn't. So I wonder why that is. So over here it uh, expected, but it received null. I wonder why that didn't really work the way that I wanted it to. So there must be some sort of bug inside of our app. So the email you input is, is invalid. That is this right over here. The email you input is invalid. Let's actually go ahead and try to run this manually. That's another form of testing. So let's just say npm run start just to run it manually, see if it works. Okay. So what are we doing here? So we have this. Okay, so let's use a different port because I'm already running something on port 3000. And let's see what port it redirects us to. Let's give it some time. Okay, how long is this gonna take? Port 3001, there we go. All right, so there we go. And let me just zoom in here for you guys. So let me type in something invalid. And if I click this, well, I actually do see it. So I'm very curious as to why this test is failing. Oh, okay, okay. I actually know exactly why this test is failing. All right, so, all right. So let's go over back to our test. So what we're doing here is we're querying it initially. So that's the very first thing that we're doing. We're running this query initially. And initially this is going to be null because it, it doesn't exist inside of our, um, it doesn't exist inside of our, uh, inside of our virtual DOM. So it doesn't exist. So it's going to be null. And so what we're doing is initially asserting that it's not there and it's passing. But then what we're doing is we're using that ex same exact variable that is initially null and then we're asserting that it's going to be in the document. So over here, this is going to give us null and we're asserting that it's going to be in the document. So what we actually need to do is make this uh, call again. So what we can say here is const, we're going to get this element and we're going to call it maybe again, something like this email error element again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to assert that that's in the document and that should work. So I hope that makes sense. So let's uh, wait a little bit here and now we should have all of our tests passing. 
and we do. So again, just a quick summary as to why that happened. Initially, this is this was null, returning null. We were expecting it not to be in the document, that passes, but then we were using that exact same variable for this assertion. We had to go ahead and make that query call again to make this work. All right, so that makes our test pass. Assignment time. So you're going to write two tests that are really similar to the one that we wrote right over here. So what are these tests? Well, now these tests are going to handle the errors for the password as well as the confirm password. So only if we input a correct email and then we input an incorrect password, so a password that is less than five characters, do we want to show this error right over here? So again, if we did this, so if we have late at hotmail.com, and so this is a proper email, and then over here we have an improper password, then we want to show this error. However, if the email is improper, and then we also put an improper password, then we want to show the email error and not this. So we only show this uh, error if this field over here is okay and it passes the check. So what I want you to do is to write a test that simulates this. So we put in a proper email, but we put in a password that is less than five characters, and then we see this error right over here. Now the next uh, test is going to test if the passwords don't match. So if we put in a proper password, a password that's greater than five characters, and we also put in a proper email, but we put in a password that is completely empty or it doesn't match, we want to show this error right over here. So what I want you to do is I want you to write two tests for these conditions. So go ahead and do that and we'll have a solution in the next video. All right, hopefully you guys gave that a go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new test block. And then here we're going to show the password error if the password. So if password is less than five characters. So that's going to be the uh, description of the test. And so in here, what we want to do is we want to type into the email and put in a valid email. So let's do that first. And honestly, we're just going to go ahead and copy some of the stuff that we have here. So we're going to go ahead and copy the render. So let's copy that. We're going to get the input element for the email. Let's copy that. And now what we want to do is we want to do a user event and we want to put a valid email. So we're going to type in a valid email address. So we're going to say something like Selena. We've been doing Selena, so let's do Selena, but this time at gmail.com. So that's a proper email. Now what we want to do is to basically do the exact same thing that we did over here. So we want to find this element right over here. So we want to find this element and let's do it at the very top. And this is going to be uh, the, the, the message, the password message, the password error message. So that's going to be uh, the password you entered should contain five or more characters. And then over here, we can say that this is going to be the password error element. And so the first thing that we want to do is we want to assert that that is not there already. So right after we type into the email, let's just do an expect here. We're going to expect that the password error element, we're going to have to do a query by and we did. We're going to say expect that to not to be in the document. Go ahead and invoke that. All right, so that's our very first assertion. And now what we want to do is, uh, well, we want to type into the password element. So let's go over here and actually we can probably copy it from up here. We can get this one, the label text. So let's go over here and let's just put that input element in. And now what we want to do is we want to type an invalid password. So let's type a password. 
uh, password error element and we're gonna type in an invalid password, maybe something like one, two, three. So that's only three characters. And then what we wanna do is we want to click on the button. Let's go here and copy that and paste that in there. We wanna work with the input element, not the error element. So now what we wanna do is we wanna click on the button. So let's find the button. Let's copy that. And you can see here that there's a lot of uh, duplicate code here. Our tests are really getting long and messy. Don't worry, we're gonna do a lot of cleanup later. So I'm gonna show you the proper ways to, you know, prevent all this duplication and all this um, extra long code. So now what we're doing here is, so once we input this, now what we wanna do is we want to uh, click on the submit button. So we're gonna say user event dot click. And then we're gonna say uh, submit button element. So we're gonna click on that. And then the last thing is we want to query for this uh, element again. So this error element. And so we can just call this again. And then what we can do is, well, we can just say very simply, expect the password input element again. And this time we expect it to be in the document. And that's pretty much the test. I know it's a very long test. And again, we're duplicating a lot of these things, but we'll fix it later. So let's go ahead and just look at our wonderful test fail. I'm not running the test because I restarted my computer. So let's, let's fix that. So our test should fail. And in the meanwhile, let's actually go ahead and fix this. So we can actually fix this very, very easily. All we have to do is add an, an if else statement over here. So what we can say here is if else, and then let's just first look at our test. So let's do A to run all of them. And then over here we can say if, uh, yeah, one of our tests passes. So we can say if the signup input dot password dot length. So if that's less than five characters, then we wanna throw that error. So now what we can say here, and when I say throw an error, we're not really throwing an error, we're just gonna set, uh, set the error to be the error that we provided uh, over here. So the password you entered is uh, should be five characters or more. So let's go here now. We're gonna say the password you entered should contain five characters or more. And this should cause it to pass. So let's go here. Let us wait, wait, wait. And I hope that passes and it does. Awesome. All right, that is terrific. And so now let's actually just uh, do the very last test. So the very last test is going to be uh, the uh, confirm password. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just copy all this cause we're gonna do a lot of duplication. So let's just copy this whole test block that we wrote. Let's paste that in there. So let's paste that in there. And again, let's look in really messy. I really don't like it, but let's just say here should uh, show confirm password error. If passwords, if, if passwords don't match so that's the error and so now what we want to do is well we want to get the email input element we want to get the password input element and then uh, we don't want to get the password error element we want to get a different one so over here let's change this to uh, what was the error message so the passwords the passwords don't match so the passwords don't match, try again. So try again. So that's, and we can make this just lowercase because we're using regular expressions here. And we can call this uh, password confirm or confirm password. Let's just call it confirm password. Confirm password. So confirm password uh, error. And so initially what should happen is uh, we should, uh, well, let's go here. This should not be on the screen or not be in the document. 
Let's add another type over here to type in the password. So let's type in the password. Uh, okay, so where is that? So over here, let's type in a valid password like one, two, three, four, five. So that is five characters. And so initially we expect it to not be on the screen. And then let's get rid of this because we did that. So in here, what we want to do is we want to actually get the confirm password input element. So let's find that. Where is that? Confirm password there. Nope, that's not it. Confirm password. Confirm password. Where is that? There we go. This works. Let's go scroll all the way to the bottom. Let's actually just put that right over here with all of its other friends. And now we can just put in an invalid password or a password that doesn't match. So here, what we can say is confirm password input element. And we can say one, two, three, four, five, six for this. Now you can see that they don't match. Then what we can do is we can click the submit button. And then we're going to query for this again. So we're going to go ahead and query for the confirm password element again. So yeah, confirm password element again, and we're going to use this template or this regular expression. And what we're going to assert is that this now is in the document. All right, that's pretty much it. Super, super long test. Let's save it and let's open up our terminal. And we got one test failing. Now to fix this test, let's go here. Now all we need is another uh, else if statement. So you can say else if, and we can say sign up dot password is not equal to sign up dot confirm password. And then we're gonna return set error. And then let's do, well, what's the message? Let's go back here, I forget already this message. All right, so the password, uh, the passwords don't match. Try again. So now if I were to save this, all the tests should pass. There we go. Awesome. All right, my good friends. Well, we're almost done this application. We really just have one more test. But before we do that, I want to note that we only tested our application through these automated tests. And to be quite frank, we shouldn't do that. We should use a combination of automated tests as well as manual tests. So let's go ahead and open up our React application. So yours should be on localhost 3000. Mine will be on localhost 3000 and well, nope. I forgot that I restarted my computer. Let's go ahead and run it and it's going to be on localhost 3000. And let's actually just do a quick uh, manual test. So if I went ahead and I uh, clicked this, it inputted and didn't even input an email, then I should get this message. Awesome. Let's put in an invalid email. I should still get this message. Now if I put in a valid email, but I don't put in any passwords, I should get the password message and okay. And um, well, maybe with this automated test, I noticed that I don't have a period. So maybe I can add that period in. So let's go here. And we could have also caught that in the, um, uh, in the automated test. Sorry, I meant manual test before. So we can add that period in. We can also have that in. Okay, cool. So now what we can do is we can input a valid password. So let's say one, two, three, four, five. And now this doesn't match. And over here, one, two, three, four, five. Well, we still see this error because we didn't clear any of the errors. So now let's just quickly do a lathe at hotmail.com. And then over here, let's just put in, uh, let's just put in one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And if we click this, then we are completely fine. So the very last thing that I want to test is if we input everything valid, then uh, we shouldn't see any errors. So let's just quickly go ahead and test that in the next video. 
The last thing I want to add is a test that checks that no error message is present if we input everything correctly. So let's go over here to our app.test.js. And this is a test that should pass right from the get go. So let's go here and let's actually just copy. Let's copy all of this. We're going to copy all of this and we're going to paste it in here. All right, and then we're gonna change this and we're gonna say that should show no error message if everything or if every input is valid. Okay, cool. So now what we have here is we have the email input element, we have the password input element, we have the confirm password input element. Let's go ahead and get rid of this. We have our button and then now let's type in something that's valid. So let's go here and we're going to say, uh, well, we're going to type into the confirm, confirm password input element, the same password that we have here. And then what we're going to do is going to get rid of this assertion. And what we're going to do here is of course, get rid of this as well. So over here we have the type email, type password, type confirm, and then we're gonna click. And then lastly over here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna assert that all of these errors are not present inside of the document. So let's also get the email error. So let's go here and where is that? So the password error, let's copy that. And let's paste that over here. Let's also find that email error. So email error, this one, let's copy that. And let's paste it right over here. We can get rid of the again. And what we can very simply do at this point is just assert that all of these are not present in the document. So we can have three assertions and then we can assert uh, this and we can assert this and this is known as asserting the happy path. So before we've, we we were asserting not the happy path, but the happy path, if everything goes fine, this is what we expect. We expect just to, no error to occur. Later on, you can add some logic I don't know, to actually sign up the user, maybe redirect them and you can test that. But for now, we just don't want to show any error. And that's really all we want to do. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And this actually should pass uh, regardless. We don't have to do any changes. So this should just be green right away. So let's uh, wait and it actually doesn't. So that means that there's something wrong with our test. And the thing, okay. So what's wrong with our test is we actually expect uh, all of these errors not to be in the document. And I said to be in the document. So let's put the not in there. So not, not. And then lastly, let's put a knot here, save that. And now it should pass. All right, come on, please, please pass. There we go, it passed. And that pretty much concludes all of the tests for this application. Congratulations, you guys really uh, worked hard with this and you built the application as well as tested it and you followed a test-driven development approach. Now there's one thing that kind of sucks about this, uh, this uh, test file is that each test is, well, some of these latter tests are really big, like very, very big as you can see. And we have a lot of code duplication. So this is obviously not great. And the same principles apply to tests that they do to normal files. We should always try to keep our application as dry as possible. And this includes the test. So we should not repeat our code. And uh, so in the next section, we're actually gonna start looking at how we can refactor the test just so we can make it a lot more organized. All right, so we wrote out all of the tests, but as you can see, it's really long and you know, the, the tests are not really dry. So what can we do to fix this? 
Well, let's actually look at each individual test. So this test right over here, the first thing that we're doing is we're rendering the app. Now, I'm actually gonna notice a little bit of a pattern if I look at every other test. So you can see here, also, we're rendering the app. Here, we're rendering the app. So actually, what's happening in every single test, we are rendering the app. So that is 100% guaranteed. So we're rendering the app component. So what can we do so that we actually don't have to explicitly say we want to render the app inside of the test block? Well, to do this, what we can use are hooks. So we can use something known as a before each hook. So a before each hook. And what this is, is a function that is going to be invoked before each test. So over here we have the function and then in here we can have a callback. And inside of the callback, we can have the logic that we want to call before each test. So for example, what we can do here is console.log console called before. So we're gonna do console.log called before. And what we should see is, right, as you can see here, before each test, we're console.logging this. So we're running this function. So we're running the callback function. So what we can actually do inside of this before each hook is call that render method and pass in the app component. And so now we can actually remove this render we can remove this render from each test. All right, so we can remove this render from each test. And let's do that. And you can see here that that already simplified our code a bit. So let's find the last render. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And I think this one's the last one. Let's get rid of that. And now if you were to save it, and if all of our tests pass, we know that everything is okay. So let's just wait and everything passes. Awesome. So you can see here that you can utilize these hooks to really simplify your code and you can plug in repetitive things so that you don't have to worry about adding them into each test. So over here we have the before each hook. Now let's talk about some of the other hooks and we won't, we won't actually utilize them, but I wanna talk about them just so you can learn about them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna console.log before each. So I'm gonna say this will, right here, let's, this will run before each test. Now there's other, other hooks that we can utilize, and these are just hooks. We can also utilize after each. So after each, you can probably imagine what it will do. So we can console.log, and we can say here, this will run after each test. So if you ever wanna do some sort of cleanup after each test, well, you can put that inside of the after each. So let's actually console.log that, just to see how that looks. All right, so we can go here and let's go all the way to the top. So you can see our very first test. So this will run before each test. And then we're gonna run this after each test we're going to do that for every single test that we have, as you can see. All right. Now there's two more hooks that I want to talk about. I want to talk about before all. So this, what is, what's going to happen with this is it's going to run only once before all of the tests. So let's go here and we're going to say that this will run once before all of the tests. So if there's anything that I have to do just one time before all of the tests, I can use the before all hook. So let's go here, let's just wait a little bit or maybe just scroll down. And so you can see if I were to scroll up, if I were to find it, where, let's just, let's just save this again. All right, there we go. So let's scroll all the way up. 
And if you were to do that, <laughs> where is it? So before all, yeah, so this will run once before all of the tests. And this is going to run before any before each hook. So you can see here that this is at the very top and then we have the before each hooks. And as you can imagine, we also have um, after all. So we can say after all, And then you can say this will run once after all of the tests. So over here, you can say after all of the tests. Let's just open that up. And there we go. So at the very end, this is going to run after all of the tests. So these are some of the different jest hooks that we can utilize. Um, more often than not, you're probably going to use the before each hook and the after each hook for cleanup. But sometimes you do want to do things once before you run your test suite and then after you run your test suite. So let's just get rid of this. And we're just going to get rid of this log. And right now, well, we simplified our test a little bit, but it's still extremely messy. So let's think of another way that we can actually simplify it. So we simplified our code a little bit. Our tests are a little bit nicer. Now we don't have to add this render app on each test. However, as you can see, there's still a lot of code and it's not really dry. Now, one thing that's really bothering me is that throughout each test, we perform the action of finding the input elements and then typing into the input elements fairly regularly. So for example, this test over here, we're finding the input elements and then we're typing into the input elements. Over here, we're also finding the input elements and then we're typing into the uh, uh, input elements. So we're, we're, this, this logic right over here is repeated throughout multiple tests. Now, what do we do when we have logic that we want to utilize throughout our code base? Well, we put that logic inside of a function and then we call that function everywhere. Well, we can do the exact same thing in a test suite. So let's actually go ahead and do that. So let's create a helper function that is going to find the elements for us and type into them. So let's go ahead and do that. So over here, let's just create a function, normal JavaScript function, and we're going to call this type into form. So this is a function that types into the form. So a normal arrow function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in an object and inside of this object, we're going to pass in the email, the password. So the password and the confirm password, confirm password. And so if we actually provided an email or a password or a confirmed password, what we want to do is we want to find that element and then type that email or password or confirm password into it. So it's just for example, let's just start with the email. So if the email, so if we actually provide an email and we actually put input something, so it doesn't really have to be an email, it just has to be any string that's, that's not undefined or an empty string. Then what we want to do is we want to type in that email inside of the email input element. So at the very top, at the very top, let's actually copy this and let's just get the email input element. And if we have an email, if we provided it with an email, what we're very simply going to do is, well, user event dot type. And we're going to say email input element. And then we're going to say whatever email that we provide. There we go. That is the very first thing. So now let's move on to the other thing. So let's add another if statement. So now if you provided us with a password, well, let's go ahead at the very top. Let's find the password uh, input element, which is this one. Let's go here at the very top. Let's paste that in. And we're going to say, user event dot type. And then what we can say here is, well, we can invoke it. We can use the password input element. And then what we can do is, well, we can type in the password. Awesome. So the last thing that we want is the confirm password. So let's say confirm password. If you provided us with a confirm password, let's go here now. Let's copy that. 
And so now what we can do is very simply add that at the very top. And now we can just do user event dot type. And over here we can say confirm password and then we can say password. All right, awesome. Very, very simple. We don't have to do much else. Uh, and actually this should be confirmed password. So this should be confirmed password here. And then here should be confirmed password. And that's pretty much it. So now what we can do is we can actually call this function whenever we need it. So let's look at this very first test. So in this very first test, we're not really doing much. We're just uh, testing that initially they're empty. So we're not doing any typing. So we'll just leave that as is. Here, however, well, what we're doing is we're doing some typing. We're typing this and we're checking if, uh, if um, that email input element, its value is uh, the same as the thing that we typed. So here we can actually utilize it. So instead of actually doing this, and let's just comment this out for now, we can actually just very simply invoke, we can invoke type into form, and then we can just pass in the email the email that we want to type. So we can just pass in this email. So look at that. Look how much simpler that is. So instead of having these two lines of code, we just have this could be even a one liner if we wanted to, we can just have it be like this. So we, instead of having this over here, we have this one liner. Now the only issue with this right now is we don't have access to the email input element. And the reason for that is even though it's in the function itself, you can see that this email input element is scoped within this function and it's not scoped within this test block. So what we can actually do to fix that is just return the elements. So we can just return the email input element. We can return the password input element, and then we can also return the confirm password input element. And so here now what we can do is we can just get the confirm password input or not the confirm password. We can just get the email input element from this function and then we can assert this. So you can see far, far simpler and less lines of code. So let's actually, uh, let's actually save that and let's see if uh, that affects our tests in any way. And it doesn't. So you can see that everything still passes, but it's a lot simpler now. So let's just do the same thing over here. So now what we want to do is we want to get rid of this or let's just comment it out for now. And now what we want to do is we want to call this function. We want to get the password input element and we want to say the password and over here we can say password. Now let's get rid of this code. Save that, should work. Let's just double check. There we go, a pass. Same ordeal over here. So let's do another refactor. So let's get rid of all of this. Let's just copy this. Here we're gonna say we want the confirm input element. And here we can just say that, and that, that should be fine. All right, so now let's move on to where it's really going to help us out. So over here, uh, what is this saying? So should show email error message on invalid email. So here you can see that we're getting, we're trying to fetch the email input element. We don't have to do that anymore. So let's get rid of that. And then here, we're not gonna type it, this in anymore. So let's also get rid of that. And, or let's just comment it out because I want to keep the email the same. So here, what we can very simply do is call type into form. And actually we don't even need to get the, uh, the email input element because we're not using it anywhere else. So we, we just needed to use it in order to type into it. But now what we can do is just invoke this and then pass in an email so we can pass in an email that is invalid like this. So now what we can do is we can get rid of this and you can see that's already a lot simpler. Awesome. Okay. So if you look at our tests, 
Oh, now it's failing. Okay, so why is that? Okay, so what test is failing? So should type it should type uh, to um, should be able to type to confirm password. So that was actually one of the tests up here that I uh, didn't even bother testing or looking at. So let's go over here to should be able to type into confirm password. Uh, so the reason for that is this should be confirm password, not password. So confirm password, and that should fix this test. And we also know that this test is passing. So now let's do the exact same thing over here. So we don't even need to bother with getting the input element. We don't even need to bother with getting the password input element because we only, we only needed to bother with them because, um, we, uh, because we, um, what am I trying to say here? Because we were trying to type into them, as you can see over here. So now what we can very simply say is type into form and we can just put a valid email. So here we can just put Selena at gmail.com. And then here we can just put a invalid password. So right here we can put an invalid password. So we can say password and we can say one, two, three here, and that should be fine as well. There we go. So if I were to save this, and that passes, all right. So that is the show error. So now let's go work with the show confirm error. So let's get rid of the password and email. And let's also get rid of this. We don't need this as well. We don't need the input elements at all. And now what we want to do is we want to type into um, type into the form. So we can just very simply say here, type into form. And instead of having two lines for this, we can just have one line. So we can say email is going to be this valid email. And then over here, what we can say is password is going to be this valid password. So one, two, three, four, five. Now we can get rid of this and over here, we can leave that as is here. We can add the other type into form. However, this time, of course, what we want to do is uh, put in a invalid confirm password. So we can say here, confirm password. We can say that is one, two, three, four, five, six. So now we can get rid of this. And I think the rest is a okay. So let's go ahead and save that. And that should still pass. And it does. So now the last thing is, well, let's test the happy case. So the last thing that we need to do, let's get rid of all of this. So let's get rid of all of this. And instead of having three lines for typing, what we're going to just simply say is type into form. And we're going to put in a valid email. Let's copy that email. We're gonna put in a valid password. So one, two, three, four, five. We're gonna also put in a valid confirm password. One, two, three, four, five. And we're gonna get rid of all this code. And now we have the user event. The rest is a okay. So now we can go ahead and save that. And there we go. Awesome. So you can see that now our, our code is a lot simpler a lot, lot simpler. Now there's still a lot of duplication and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Actually, it's going to be an assignment for you guys to do. However, you can see that this is, this is the way to go to reduce the um, uh, duplication within our test suite. All right, my good friends, it is challenge time. In this challenge, what you're going to do is create a helper function that is going to find the submit button and click on the submit button. So if you actually look throughout the test, a lot of the time we're trying to find the submit button and then we're clicking on the submit button. Over here, you're finding the submit button, we're clicking on the submit button. So, you know, this is a lot of code duplication that we can reduce with a function. So what I want you to do is create a helper function that is going to reduce this, to do this action. And then I want you to call it in those tests uh, blocks instead of doing these stuff manually. 
So go ahead and try that out. And as always in the next video, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Okay. Hopefully you guys gave that a go. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go all the way to the very top and we're going to create a new function. We're going to say, click on submit button. That's going to be the function. And this one's going to be really easy. So the first thing we need to do is find the submit button. So let's go to one of our tests where we do that. So we're going to go ahead and copy that, paste that in there. And then let's do a user event dot click and then submit button. And we don't have to return anything because we never really do anything with the submit button other than click on it. Now, if we did do something with it, so if we asserted that it was in the document or something, then we could return it if we want to. So over here, let's start utilizing in our test. Now, before we do that, let's actually just look at how many lines we have. So we have 167 lines. So let's see how much this reduces it. So let's go here. So over here, let's get rid of this block of code. And here, let's just replace this with click on button. Very simple. That's it. That's all we need. And we can get rid of these two over here. And there we go. So over here, we can replace that with just click on button and we can get rid of this line of code. And then let's, uh, let's look, let's look here. We can replace this here. We can get rid of this line of code. And uh, last thing that we need to do is this one we can replace this. And we can get rid of this line of code. I think that's it. Let's see. And it is it. Awesome. So let's go ahead and just save that and then take a quick look. So you can see that that actually saved us what like 20 or I don't know. I actually well, it was 67 before now it's 50 uh, 152. So if my math is correct. That's 15 lines of code that that one little function saves us. So you can imagine how much lines of code that this saved us over here. Uh, I guess I also didn't really factor in the creation of the function. So maybe really only saved us 10 lines of code. All right. So that's great. And you can see that this is actually not, not only does it reduce uh, um, duplication, it also makes our tests a lot more readable. So now if I, you know, I were to look at this test, the super, super long test, uh, I can just very simply say, okay, well, we're typing into the form. That makes sense. We're typing in the email, the password, and then, you know, we're asserting that it's not in the document. And then we type into the form again, we click on the button, and then we assert that this is um, in the document. So you can see it's a lot more readable than what we had before. Now we can also do one last thing to make it better. Well, there's, there's actually a few more things, but in terms of reducing the lines of code, we can do one more thing and we'll talk about that in the next video. There is one thing that we can actually do to significantly simplify our tests. And let's actually look at this test specifically to illustrate this point. Now in this test, let's look at the, this block right over here. So these four lines. So what are we doing here? Well, we're first finding the element. So we're finding this error element and we're assigning it to this variable. And then what we're doing is we're getting this variable, we're putting it inside of the assertion, and then we're doing to be in the document. So won't it be better to just skip this step altogether? Why do we care about this step? Why not just get this right over here and just plug it in there? So we can plug it in there and just completely get rid of this. So there's really no point of assigning it into a variable if we're only going to be using it once. So now what we can do, if we were to save this, you can see that our code is a lot simpler. And over here, we can actually do the exact same thing on this exact same test. So now what we can do is copy this and we can just plug that in there. And now we can get rid of this. And just to prove to you that everything still works, let's go to our terminal and uh, let's go here and you can see that everything passed. So now let's actually do that uh, with all the other tests and just look at that beautiful test. Like look how simple it is. 
So now we're expecting that whatever this element is, it's not going to be in the document. Then we're going to type the email. We're going to click the button. Then we're going to expect that it is in the document. Just look, that's an amazing test. Sorry. Uh, sorry, we kind of went on a tangent. So uh, let's let's go here. So this is an excellent example of this. So let's just get the screen and we can just very much put that in there. We can get this. We can put that in there. And now we can just simply get this. And we can put that in there. Oops. Uh, what am I missing here? Yeah, so we can get this. We should be able to put this in in there. What am I missing? Oh, yeah, I'm adding a semicolon. All right, so now what we can do is completely get rid of that. And just for uh, test sake, let's Let's look at our tests. Everything still passes. Awesome. All right. Can we do the same thing over here? Uh, not really. So that will be fine. This is fine. This is fine. This we already did here. Uh, the input uh, error elements. We can actually just copy this or cut this out, get rid of this completely, and then uh, just put this right in here. And we can do the exact same thing right here. So we can get rid of this variable. And so now we can get rid of that and we can paste that in. Awesome. So now let's look at this test. Let's cut this out. Let's put that in there. We can get rid of this now. Uh, and now over here, we can just get rid of this, cut the whole thing out, paste this in here. And there we go. Awesome. So now we can do the exact same thing over here. I think this is the last test. So this is actually a, an excellent example of how useful this can be. Uh, so look how many how much code we have here, this unnecessary code. So again, let's just get this. Let's paste that in there. Let's also get this. And we're going to paste this in here. And now we're going to get this and paste this in here. So let's paste that in there. And now we can get rid of this. Awesome. And now you can see we were at 152. Now it dropped to, oh my goodness, maybe another like 18 or something. I'm not really sure with my math. But you can see that everything is passing and our test suite is looking beautiful. There is one last thing that I want to talk about and that is the describe block. So right now, if we were to look at every single test here, they all have one common thing that they're doing. They're testing the functionality of the app component. So what we can do is we can group similar tests together inside of a describe block. So let's actually go ahead and do that. So right above all of the tests, what we can do is we can have a describe block and this is going to be exactly the same as the test block. So we're going to have a callback function right over here. And inside of this callback, we can group all similar tests. So what we can say here is, as the first parameter, we can describe the describe block. So we can say that here we're just testing the app component. Then we can get all of these tests and just put them inside of the describe block. Awesome. And if we wanted, we can have multiple describe blocks and we can put our tests accordingly into whatever describe block that we want. Another thing that we can actually do is we can nest describe blocks. So right here, we have all the tests that are testing the app component. But if we go right over here, these tests are specifically testing the error handling of our app component. So what we can do if we want is add a describe block over here and we can say error handling. So this is what we're testing. So error handling and this is in the app describe block. And we can have another arrow function. And we can just very simply take all of these tests that are handling the errors. So the last test is this one. 
you can cut it out let's let's come on uh, did I go too much no I didn't awesome and I can actually put that inside of this describe block so that is another way that we can organize similar tests together and if we were to run this Let's go here, delete this, go here. You can see that, well, everything runs a okay. Awesome. That is cool. Now, one thing that I want to talk about is describe blocks. They actually serve more functionality than grouping things together. If, for example, we wanted to run something before each set of tests. So for example, maybe I wanted to run something before each three out of the 10 tests in my test suite. So right here I have, I don't know, three tests. Maybe I wanted to run a test before each of the tests that handle the error handling. Well, what I can do is inside of the describe block, I can add, add a before each or before all or after each or after all. And it's only going to affect, it's only going to be ran uh, for the tests inside of the describe block. So right here, how many tests do we have? One, two, um, one, two, three, four, four tests. So let's just go ahead and console.log, console.log hello, and we should only see it four times. We shouldn't see it uh, however many tests we have. So we have another, another uh, four tests here. So we should not see it eight times. We should only see it four times. So if we were to open up our terminal and look at the tests, <clears throat> uh, we can go scroll up, up, up. If we can find it, where is it? Do I, do I just not see it? Where is it? Oh, here we go. So we got hello, hello, and we should see hello, hello four times. And if you scroll up, we'll never find it. So we only see that four times. So if you want to run something before uh, uh, before each uh, test, but we only want it for a specific set of tests, we put them inside of a describe block. Now this right over here, so this before each, well, this is going to run uh, for every test. And the reason for that is because, well, it's at the very top level. And actually it's best practice to move it inside of this uh, uh, describe block right over here. So now what we can do is, well, everything is still going to work because this is going to be ran before each test that is inside of this describe block. And yes, these tests that are nested are also inside of that describe block. All right. Awesome. So let's just quickly, uh, take a quick look at this. All the tests still pass.